Hey, um, I need to stay close to the to the thing here so that you can hear me on the video stream. If I walk away, you have to tell me somehow that I move back here because I will walk away. Anyway, um, hi. Um, I'm Lennart Pellering. I work for Microsoft, but this was already introduced. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, unified kernel images, which are awesome. Um, some of the work in this talk I actually did, but most actually I didn't. It's other people, but uh, yeah. Um, I want to give a, like a, a summary, first of all, of the basic concept, but I have the suspicion that most of you probably have some idea about the basic concept. Um, but uh, yeah, I want to go into detail about uh, what's new in this area um, and that was added in the last months and weeks um, and uh, basically the last year. Uh, because it has so much going on as it appears that the, that the Linux uh, ecosystem is kind of moving towards this model. Not just in uh, special applications but probably also in the, in the broader, um, the more generic distribution uh, area. So, um, let's jump right in. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions, totally interrupt me. I much prefer having discussions here than me just talking. Um, Please raise your hand, I will come to you with the microphone. Okay, um, okay so what were UKIs again? Um, it's a bit of a recap um, for those uh, who maybe never heard of it um, and for the others as well. Uh, the really short summary, it's a Linux kernel, and in an RD, a kernel command line, um, all that packed into one UFI PEP binary so that you can uh, sign it as a whole uh, with a program called System to Stop Glued in Front um, and uh, possibly other stuff included like uh, the boot splash, like which is basically just some graphics that is put on screen before the kernel initializes, a device tree image, uh, which is what some embedded devices need, um, um, operating system release information so that you have some metadata, what are you actually looking at before you boot it. Um, yeah, it's a single file where it's everything contained that is basically the, the first part of the operating system that is then capable to find the root file system. Or maybe even it could be the whole uh, OS as well uh, in certain environments. It's extremely robust for updates uh, because, yeah, if you want to update the kernel and the inner, you just drop in one file. If you want to delete an old one, you just delete one file. Um, that makes it very simple, very robust, which is a good thing because uh, uh, we're talking about UEFI PE binaries, which are supposed to uh, be placed in the, in the um, ESP, in the EFI system partition, which is VFAT, and as we all know, VFAT is, uh, sorry. I'm sorry, folks, I was just informed. We can't stand on the side there. If you want to move inside of that room and watch from there, that would be great. But there are There's, also like three. Yes, and there are more seats, um, so please take a seat if you can. Yeah, there are like four seats over here, somewhere. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, where was I? EFI system partition. Yeah, so that's uh, VFAT, and that's uh, terrible because it's like a, 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 a file system from, I don't know, end of the 90s, I think. Um, so it has terrible um, uh, safety guarantees. Um, but uh, this way we can make the best of it, right? Like it's, it's uh, much easier to just dropping in one file, removing in one file and making that safe and robust than it is if it was a many and we would have to change things around. Um, yeah, one of the most important things though is the sign as a whole thing, which basically means um, uh, UFI generally means secure boot, mean, which means that uh, we have to sign our binaries and if they are not signed, the system won't boot them. Um, by gluing it all together and signing it as one whole, um, that makes things a lot easier in that area because you cover all the code um, up to some point uh, with a signature um, and you don't need to f figure out like uh, a chain of uh, signed objects like how you build all that. So uh, it's basically the firmware that uh, validates the whole thing until uh, the root file system is active. Um, these uh, files um, are, there's a question. So I see that the kernel command line is part of the UKI image. Does it mean that they cannot change any kernel parameters from the bootloader? Well, let's talk about that. Sorry. Uh, let's talk about that specific issue later because it's an absolutely valid issue and much discussed issue and we certainly have uh, ways to address that. Um, these uh, UKIs are enumeratable um, basically because you, like, there's a, uh, 
an accompanying specification, which is the uh, bootloader specification, which um, basically says in the ESP there's one directory. If you put U UKI there, that's enough for uh, to make it show up on, on compatible boot menu implementations like uh, systemd boot. Um, and because it, uh, these images carry information about what this is, maybe I should turn off my cell phone. Um, uh, because they carry all the information that you, that uh, what is actually contained in there, it's uh, um, self-contained, right? You just drop something into the directory that is entirely enough. The boot menu can find the stuff, can figure out what it is, can figure out which version it is, can order it against other versions and show it uh, nicely in the boot menu and even make a pick for you like that it automatically um, boots the newest thing. Okay, um, there is a specification nowadays, um, I think Luca put it together, which tries to um, uh, generalize this. Um, there is like the implementation, of course, there's one in uh, systemd um, with, together with systemd stub, and we have a couple of tools which we'll um, discuss later. Um, but uh, it's actually, I mean, the concept is totally generic. There's nothing systemd about this. Um, it's just a PE file with a couple of sections, and we defined what these sections mean. So, uh, yeah, we have the specification. You can go there, um, uh, and we'll tell you everything how to build this. Let's uh, next focus on one specific component of all of this, which is systemd stop, which is a UEFI binary, like a PE binary, that is actually put in, in front of the, of the kernel and the inner ID. Or you could even actually say it another way, systemd stop is the actual binary that is invoked by um, the UEFI firmware and just happens to you stash in a couple of its sections some data that it will then invoke. So systemd stub um, is our implementation of UFI stub, so it runs in UFI mode, does a couple of things, then transitions into the kernel that is part of, like, that is, is, is a payload, um, and then ceases to exist because exit boot services gets called, which is like this, this one call in the UFI firmware that basically terminates the early boot phase and the, the, the firmware phase and moves it to the OS phase. Um, yeah, it's glued in front of a kernel, and for us, it's kind of what makes up in, in UKI. Um, first, it runs in U UFI mode, and then hands off control to the kernel. Um, does a couple of things. I mentioned that one of them is brings that boot splash, if there is one defined um, to screen. Measures, like TPM measurement. Um, I, I have another talk about uh, TPMs and stuff in Linux. Um, I'll discuss these things uh, in more detail. Uh, later there, but uh, yeah, one key thing it does, it measures the UKI components, which is half redundant because the firmware does that too, but there are good reasons to do it again, um, uh, simply because it's more fine-grained. We'll discuss that in the other um, talk. It picks something up we call credentials. Credentials are a way um, how a systemd can securely parameterize systems and services. They're basically little blobs of data that can be, I don't know, SSL certificates, could also be configuration file, could be passwords, could be all these kind of things that you can encrypt and link to your TPM. And uh, one nice thing is you can put these credentials in the ESP and then SD boot will put, uh, uh, pick them up and give them to the to the inner RD, uh, which can then authenticate, decrypt them and use them. So it's basically a way how you can securely uh, parameterize a, uh, a UKI um, uh, so that uh, it's like you don't um, break the, the Sakiboot tr um, uh, um, trust boundary. Uh, this way because uh, yeah, these little bits of information are always authenticated before they are used um, where that means um, that they are signed or uh, like with the TPM bound key. Um, it also picks something up we call system extension, sysx, um, which is like another system D feature. It's basically how you can overlay slash user with additional files. It's our model how we think that extensible inner IDs could work, right? Like so you build a a, a main uh, inner ID into the UK, UKI, and then sometimes and you need additional drivers um, or in things like that, like for example NVIDIA drivers or something like this, that you don't want to build into the UKI because not all systems will need them and because they're huge. So uh, the system extensions gives you a little bit of give you a little bit of modularity there. You, 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 they are ultimately just um, like we call them DDIs, like SquashFS or something like this, um, that are DM Verity enabled and can be locked against the kernel and they're signed and things like that. Anyway, we can pick these up as well from the ESP, like the credentials, and pass it to the booted kernel. SD stub does that. Um, yeah, passes all that on to the kernel. Um, this happens actually via an on-the-fly generated inner RD CIPIO. Just a little bit of background. The inner RD, as mentioned, is like the first thing that the kernel starts, um, like the first user space that the kernel starts, and it's traditionally a CPIO archive, which is like a tarball, just older and simple. 
simpler. And because it's so extremely simple, we can just generate one on the fly um, from, from system stuff. So that's what we do, how, how to pass the data that we picked up, like the credentials and system extensions um, to the rest of the system. There's a couple of other things. One of them is random seed management, which basically means um, we maintain a random seed um, in, the, in the ESP, like a, a, a saved random seed that is updated in every boot. Um, it's actually written, like the, the code was uh, recently rewritten by the guy who maintains also the kernel RNG. Um, uh, and uh, the big benefit of this is that, uh, yeah, on EFI systems basically now um, we'll always come up with a fully seeded um, uh, random seed no matter what um, that is not reliant simply on the CPU RNG but uh, yeah, can use this stuff as well. Um, yeah. Any questions so far? Otherwise, we'll jump into a little bit. I mean, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about the TPM stuff uh, in more detail in my TPM talk. But uh, to get a little bit of detail what it actually does before it hands off control to the kernel, um, it will measure some of the, uh, or all but one of the UKI components into PCR 11 uh, or PCR 12 or PCR 13, everything that it picks up um, so that uh, you can later um, bind uh, security policies, like for example, disk encryption to a specific set, like to a specific UKI booted or um, to the vendor of specific UKI um, or a specific configuration. Um, these PCRs 11, 12, and 13, I like these are, I don't know, like does anyone, everybody know what PCR is, even is? Should I explain that? Okay, so uh, TPMs, you know, all these security chips in, in all your laptops, and uh, nowadays they're even often virtualized for VMs and clouds and things like this. Um, so what these TPMs generally do is that they can store key material for you, um, and then uh, you can operate on them. It's like a smart card um, without uh, the key material ever being extractable. And one specific facet that they have is that they maintain a set of registers called PCRs. These PCRs, basically, um, Every component of the boot process is supposed to measure what it's going to use next before it's using it um, into these PCRs. Measuring means basically it takes a hash value of that data, passes it to the TPM, and the TPM hashes that hash plus the current value of the register together. What does this effectively mean? Um, that basically means before um, every component of the boot process transitions to the next one, it will measure the next step. And that means at the end, the hash values that are stored in the PCRs will um, reflect exactly the path of the boot um, that, that was taken, right? Every single piece of code, of configuration, of anything else that uh, went into the boot process will be, um, have an effect on these PCRs, meaning that if you change anything of that, the measurements will be different. The hashes will be different and the resulting values um, are different. Why is this interesting? This is interesting because the, PCR, uh, the TPM then allows you to bind um, access control to these keys that it can manage for you to the values of the PCRs. That basically means that you can say, I want that my key is only accessible if the PCR values have this, 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 or this value. And if they have anything else, then they are not accessible. This is a fantastic thing. I think um, uh, like, uh, I like it way better, for example, than SecureBoot and things like that. Uh, because it basically allows you to say, my Fedora shall be able to unlock the Fedora disk encryption key. But this way, you implicitly also can say that if you boot something else, like Ubuntu or like some, I don't know, attacker-controlled OS, um, that these keys shall not be accessible. Anyway, I'll go into my, that into way more detail in, uh, in, uh, uh, in my other talk. Um, way too much detail in my other talk, of course. Uh, suffice to say, there are 24 of these PCRs. Um, many of them are um, owned and uh, described in specifications uh, um, like that basically describe how a PC works. Uh, but some of them are up for the West to grab. We grabbed these three, so they're my private property now. Um, uh, um, so this is basically where we measure certain parts of the West into 11, 12, and 13. Actually, we measure, we took possession of more PCRs, but yeah. Anyway, these PCRs originally started at zero because they are not used by the PC firmware before we um, take control of the system. Uh, they are zero at that point in time, and this is awesome because it basically means that uh, if I look at a UKI and I boot that UKI and it will measure its components to these PCRs, I can tell, say ahead of time, before I even booted that UKI, what the PCRs are going to look like. And if I can do that ahead of time, 
then I uh, um, can write a policy um, to the TPM that basically says, whenever I sign these sets of PCRs with a cryptographic key of my choice, then unlock the secrets. So the, this is the nice model how, for example, Fedora can say, any Fedora kernel shall be allowed to unlock the secret key um, by simply providing a signature of the expected PCR values against the Fedora key that was used um, uh, to, to uh, um, yeah, enroll the, crypto, like the disk encryption key. Um, yeah, if this is too much for you right now, there's the other talk which goes into that into much detail. Um, this cryptographic signature that I mentioned is actually included in the UKI, which is awesome because it basically means you boot up the UKI and it comes with all the information to unlock the secrets um, needed for disk encryption that shall only be releasable if this kernel or related kernels that have, or have, a, key, have a signature assigned by the same key um, uh, shall be accessible by. Okay, so uh, yeah, what is the net result of this? You have a, a reasonably safe unattended disk encryption, meaning like uh, if you ever um, uh, install a system that where there's no interactivity, like a server, like some Amada device somewhere, you now have a way how to do a relatively secure unattended disk encryption, right? Like the system boots up, and this uh, disk encryption key is released to the OS exactly th uh, if the OS is uh, um, in a specific state with only signed code and signed configuration by the vendor of the West. You can also um, instead include a pin in this, so then you have um, interactive um, uh, authentication if somebody has to type it in. Um, but it also means that, yeah, it's not going to unlock if somebody else manipulated the US. You will always detect if somebody manipulated the US, the firmware, or any other kind of configuration. Um, yeah, so. Uh, any specific questions? I know this is a lot, but yeah, it's going to be a lot more in the TPM talk. But uh, any questions at this point? There's a question, Luca. Uh, does the policy also include the PCR values uh, provided by the firmware? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, so uh, this, no. This stuff that I'm talking about here does not, because it covers only the UKI, which is, under my assumption, built by the vendor. Like, let's say Red Hat builds uh, um, uh, RHEL kernels, uh, UKI kernels, um, and then it can uh, generate a TPM policy out of that that applies to basically all RHEL kernels. But um, this does not include the firmware, because this is outside of the control of what the vendor, in this case Red Hat, for example, uh, would, uh, uh, can control, right? Like, because it doesn't know um, what kind of server this is on. It doesn't know in which combination um, uh, um, you will run your, your hardware, if you'll have an extension card, how you configure your stuff. So this is not included in this. This is only uh, covers the part that is actually shipped by the West vendor. I will, like in my TPM talk, I will cover that other part though because I have something, I've um, uh, 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 been preparing there to cover that ground. But it's uh, not orthogonal to this one, but it's, it's, it's independent of this one. Um, there's a question. Luca, here? Yeah. Oh, oh, there. How can we guarantee that TPM won't leak these secrets? Sorry? How can we guarantee that TPM won't leak these secrets, say, disk encryption keys? I mean, uh, the, this, the TPM is supposed to be this piece of hardware where you cannot extract the, the, the secrets from. So um, it's like you have to put your trust somewhere in your computer. The idea is that you put it in the TPM. Are TPMs going to be shitty? Probably, yeah. Um, but also, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of the, the point of the TPM to not uh, make the uh, uh, secrets accessible unless the access policies are fulfilled, in this case, the PCR policies. So you're measuring trust against a public-private key pair of the vendor. Where does that come from at boot time to know what to trust? So when you um, 
when you enroll the disk encryption, like when you set up the disk encryption for the first time, you basically say the TPM, okay, I'm going to give you this, the secret key here, you keep it for me, and I'm telling you that uh, whenever uh, somebody comes back, um, you, mu uh, you, you must provide you with a signature by this specific key pair. So at install time, basically, let's say again, if the example is rel, rel um, would give its uh, signature key that is under control of Red Hat um, um, to the TPM and say, okay, only if this key is applied. So by the way, if I say vendor, this doesn't necessarily mean vendor, it could also be your own key, right? Like, so uh, this is up to like, um, my, my assumption is basically that the, depending on what kind of uh, distribution you have, um, it's either gonna be the vendor's key or it's gonna be your private key. Like for example, Debian, Arc Linux, um, like these more community, community focused, they're probably gonna put a lot of emphasis on, uh, yeah, you generate your own key, you sign the stuff with your own key, you install the, the, your own key in the disk encryption, but the more commercial ones, um, um, that have a different like attack um, uh, um, scenarios to deal with, uh, they probably will enroll the, the vendor key. But I mean, it's, I don't know how the vendors will deploy this up to them ultimately, but that's my design uh, idea. So I've got a question um, surrounding upgrades. How are you dealing with the case where somebody um, as, is essentially lagging behind in updates, meaning that they may be a couple of UKI revisions behind, Turns out that they update. Um, the new UKI doesn't yep. work on the system for whatever reason. They need to revert. But how then is your update update policy? Is your updating tool able to s ensure that the previous UKI can still boot? So uh, again, like this one actually does not have any form of rollback protection, which um, basically means that. Uh, any software, any UKI signed this way, or that has a signature for the PCR signed this way, can access your secrets, right? This is actually, I mean, for you, this now sounds like a good thing because it basically means you can use the 10 year old kernel um, if it's signed by the same key and still work. But it's actually a bad thing, right? Like, because it basically means that if there's a key, like if there's a kernel that is vulnerable, um, this stuff does not give you any way to in invalidate it and take away access. But I have this other thing that, like, I also was mentioning about locking down the firmware that's going to deal with that stuff, which is going to add rollback protection so that we basically can say, yeah, um, uh, um, these three currently installed kernels, they'll get access, but the other stuff is, uh, won't. But let's talk about that in the, in the other uh, talk. Any other? More There's question another. over there. You said that it's possible to create overlay files in the user directory and to uh, regenerate the init RD at boot time. Uh, do these overlays also have to be provided by the vendor? Um, so, I mean, the, the, the concept behind this is called system is sysx, and that basically is just an overlay fs, uh, and the images are based, uh, assumed to be something like a, like a variety enabled squash fs or something like this. And um, the uh, signatures of these um, DM Verity uh, top level hashes um, uh, are supposed to be in the kernel key ring. How they end up in the kernel key ring, um, this is up for discussion. Um, one assumption, of course, is that um, the kernel key ring is supplied by the uh, by the OS vendor at uh, build time of the kernel. So that would basically mean, let's say, again, example, Red Hat. Red Hat builds the Red Hat signing key into the kernel, and that basically means uh, only the, the, the system extension signed by Red Hat will be activated. But there's mock and these kind of things. And these um, uh, mock is like this early boot key management stuff in UFI mode. But uh, one effect of that is that the mock keys actually end up get loaded into the kernel key ring on most distributions. Um, so the idea is, yeah, it's up to you, right? Like that by default, it's gonna be the vendor key only, but then you can enroll additional keys with mock, for example, and then bam, you can not only just load your own kernel modules that you signed, but can also activate the system extensions that you signed, um, and yeah. There's another one. So does that mean that you can have multiple signing keys that are valid at the same time. Sorry? Does that mean you can have uh, multiple public keys that, that are valid at the same time? Yeah. I mean, it, it really depends. Like, are we talking now about system extensions? Yes, absolutely, because a kernel key ring is a key ring. Um, for the PCR uh, um, uh, uh, signatures um, that unlock your disk secrets, um, for every key um, you want to sign with, you need to provide another signature, of course. 
but yeah, that too. Um, like you would have to enroll it though at that moment. We currently actually don't support this, but there's the, like a system decrypt enroll, which is like gonna enroll the TPM stuff for you to the to the disk encryption. We currently, or maybe we do, no, but I don't think we do um, uh, allow you to specify alternatives. Um, but there's no technical reason why we don't. We just don't because we don't. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking use cases like. Um key migrations by vendors, uh, where they might be moving from a older, weaker key format, but wanting to do it gradually. Yeah, that's a good question. Like, uh, um, I don't know exactly how that this will work, um, but I would assume basically that if you do something like this, you would probably you just automatically enroll when you unlock um, the new key or something like this. Also, but the current occurring supports CA chains. So Sorry? The current occurring supports CA chains. OK, so, so I hear that, that the kernel key rig actually supports CA chains. Um, and that would basically mean, uh, yeah, you can solve it that way. So um, does this scheme include secure boot at all? Hmm. Um, so the, yeah, that's a good question. So I mean, Secure Boot is one thing. As a, just as a little recap, Secure Boot is a thing where basically the system comes with basically a key ring of of allowed signing keys for any code that runs uh, is run by the firmware. And there's the other thing called Measured Boot. Measured Boot is this thing that I was talking about with the PCRs, right? Like where every component is first measured before it's invoked. I personally think Measured Boot is way more interesting technology because Secure Boot, I mean, it's, 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 it doesn't really scale, right? Like it's and because there's so much stuff um, signed by uh, the Microsoft key and by the shim stuff, and nobody really reviews that code, right? Like so it's, uh, I mean, the fact that if I install Fedora on my system, this also implies that Windows can just boot um, is kind of weird, or that I uh, install Fedora and this also implies that I can automatically boot um, the SUSE as well. It's also kind of weird. Measured boot is way more interesting technology because you basically say at the moment you, you put the disk encryption key in the system, you say, yeah, I bind it to my installation of Fedora and then no, it doesn't help if you use um, Hacker Distro X or so on. Um, it will not get access to these keys because it not, cannot reproduce the, the, um, the PCR values. So, uh, um, or personally, I find um, like I mean, Sakya in particular because I mean, there's so many, <laughs> so many. Uh, 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 recall binaries there. I think uh, it's like, I mean, so, so the SUSE people um, I, I, last year or something heard, heard them say that they are not actually that interested in Secure Boot at all and they want to focus on Measured Boot. And uh, I sympathize with that thinking. Um, I might even subscribe to it um, one day. So. <laughs> So one problem that I see is the FEI um, partition size, because it's not huge typically. Uh, is there a way to split some of this stuff into a separate partition? Um, uh, that's a good question. Comes up often. So. Um uh, uh, yeah, the, the UKI model is that you drop these kernels into the ESP, and the ESP, if it's not uh, um, like huge, then you cannot put that many in there, if, particularly if you have large NDRDs with NVIDIA drivers, which like 100 megabytes or something like this. Um, my thinking, of course, is like if you do a clean install, like a server install, just size the ESP large. Like there's nothing stopping you making it a couple of gigabytes. That's what I would always recommend you. I do acknowledge, though, that this is not the reality of PCs, right? Like if you go to your electronic store and buy a Windows PC and then want to dual boot, uh, Linux, uh, that's not going to be like that because I mean, some, some uh, uh, laptop vendors made it 100 megabytes or less, and that is very limiting um, if you have an NVIDIA driver. So we came up with this thing called, I mean, it's fucking ugly, but okay, uh, we have to deal with this. So we came up with this other um, partition that is a lot like the ESP, um, also basically VFAT, um, also has a partition type UAD that makes it recognizable. We call it the extended bootloader partition, or X boot LDR, um, uh, and the idea basically is like like a bootloader, like system D uh, boot, which uh, finds UKIs and finds um, type one uh, bootloader spec entries. It actually looks both in the ESP and in this X bootloader partition. And uh, so uh, yeah, if you have if you install a Linux on such a system that has a too small ESP and you don't want to grow the ESP because that's hard and risky. Uh, then you just instead add like a gigabyte or two of uh, of Xbooler partition, and then you put your kernels there and leave the ESP like in the ESP you you, you manage your bootloader, and then the Xbooler partition you put the UKIs um, and things like that. <laughs> 
But I would always say, this is a like an escape hatch for these PCs. Um, if you if you think about clean systems, embedded system servers, right, like they that run exactly the OS you want them, don't bother with it. Just put put make the ESP large enough, put the stuff in the ESP. Sorry? 15 minutes, okay. I mean, I have many more slides, but I actually love this discussion, so uh, I'm not complaining if I don't manage to go through this. But let's maybe do throw one slide in there. So uh, in, uh, in Systemd, we have a couple of components nowadays uh, that help you with uh, dealing with UK, uh, UKIs. I mean, yeah, in particular the word, I don't even know how to pronounce UKIFI yet, not yet. I think there are disagreements of it's UKFI or UKIFI. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, um, so uh, one tool is System to Measure. Um, that's a tool that will calculate these PCR signatures for you. Um, like it will basically look at the UKI, um, uh, um, predict what the PCR measurements are going to be if this UKI gets booted up. Um, then uh, uh, calculates the, the, uh, a signature based on that um, with the signing key of your choice um, and gives it to you so that it can embed it into UKI and then yeah this ends up so that you can enroll easily your, your disk encryption against that. Um, there's another call to a tool, like system measure is a C tool, UK, UKFI is a Python tool, um, it's basically a built uh, thing so that it can easily build UKI files. Um, so basically, it, uh, like it traditionally it was done with an object copy command line. Like object copy is this tool from bin utils, like from the from the package where the the linker and everything like that is. Uh, UKI uh, is now replaces that. It's written in Python and basically you just give it the components and it spits out. A, uh, a UKI um, that has all the system to measure stuff in there is also Secubrid signed um, and various other things. Um, so my recommendation would always be uh, use that tool if you're a distribution. It's uh, very, very easy. You just specify the components and say this is the output thing and then there you go. What's also interesting is um, uh, you know, kernel install is this, it used to be a shell script that we ship with systemd and its purpose is that uh, like if you install a kernel RPM, basically, um, that it takes the, uh, the kernel image that is in that RPM and uh, copies it into the right place in the ESP or wherever else it shall be placed. It has this plugin based infrastructure. Kernel install is ad adopted by a couple of distributions, not by all of them, but by a couple of them. Um, What's new now is that uh, we have these two uh, modules um, uh, that uh, allow you to work with UKIs. And, um, uh, 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 help you treating UKIs like you would uh, treat a, a traditional kernel in many ways. So uh, kernel install, as I mentioned, is now a C tool um, which copies the kernels into, into the place. Um, these uh, plugins can replace or extend the default implementations and yeah, so 60, um, like they are always numbered with the prefix which is simply because they shall be executed in that order. So ukify install basically can that man, uh, that you invoke that ukify command um, if you want to, uh, locally, to turn a traditional kernel into UKI on demand on the local system. This is useful for distributions like Debian, like Arc Linux, where people want to be in control and sign their own kernels. It's not what you should be using on a, on a big vendor uh, commercial OS, because there you want to sign the kernels on the build systems um, of, the, of the OS and not on the local system. But um, for distributions like Arc Linux and these kind of things, where local people shall be in control, they basically have, now have a very, very easy way how they can just say, okay, I put my uh, signing key here, and then whenever I install a kernel and you just locally sign it with a locally key, uh, like a key that only is locally and feel basically like it always felt, um, except that it's now super secure. <laughs> the other tool is UK5, uh, sorry, that's a typo, it's U UKI copy, not UK5 copy. Um, that actually puts its UKIs in place, um, which is slightly different how you put traditional kernels in place because it's type two instead of type one bootloader spec stuff. Um, a couple of other things we added recently, uh, like well, there are more sections, like PE sections in UKIs, like there's .uname, which is, like we already uh, always had .os rel um, in these UKIs that basically tell uh, tools like sdboot ahead of time what the OS is that the kernel is for. Uh, we now added uh, .uname, which is kind of obvious thing, not sure why we never added this uh, earlier, which uh, has information about the kernel itself as opposed to the OS, right? Like, um, so it basically contains the string of uname-r. Um, and uh, it's also used by sdboot and a couple of other things to, to order things in the boot menu so that you always get the newest kernel 
um, uh, um, uh, first. It's, it's mostly like the reason why we it didn't have this is mostly because it was always written in design that you would bump the entire West version whenever you update the kernel. But this is obviously not compatible with like package-based distributions where you can mix and match. So that's why we added this. Um, there's what, some more support for something called ASPAT. ASPAT is some uh, recent um, uh, addition to Shim, like this this uh, uh, Secure Boot thingy, uh, which allows revocation, right? Like where basically every component of the uh, UFI boot process can declare um, uh, what its components are, and it can be used um, uh, to revoke old versions in a lot more efficient way than this is currently handled by Secure Boot. So uh, we support that in UK file as well, so that the yeah, you see that information directly in the UK file. Um, I don't have that much time anymore, but this is the last thing I basically really want to cover. Well, something that uh, is new that we added is UKI add-ons. I still have 10 minutes. Um, UKI add-ons, so, like, the whole idea of UKI is that they're monolithic, right? Like, you take one kernel, you take an inner, you glue it together, and this is a monolithic thing. And if you want to update anything about it, you have to update the whole kernel image. This is great, but this also is limiting because sometimes people want multiple flavors um, of the same thing or because they um, want to have, like, the vendor can build uh, the UKI, but the local administrator can uh, um, extend it in some way, like add a kernel command line option, um, add a device tree thingy or whatever else, right? Like, so um, the, the, the pure UKI model kind of says there's only one vendor who signs the UKI and that uh, comprehensively describes what's going to be booted. This clashes with reality where you usually have different um, owners uh, of uh, components that want to supply stuff. So we came up, or actually um, Luca came up with the concept of uh, uh, add-ons. Add-ons, like he originally called it mules. Um, it's basically it's a PE binary, like a UFE, UF, UEFI PE binary, right? Like, uh, that's how it looks like, um, so that it, it contains executable code. But actually, it doesn't contain any, any executable code. It only co contains the PE sections that can carry kernel command lines, inner RDs, uh, no, not right now, actually, inner RDs, but that's probably going to happen, um, device tree information, like all the other stuff that we st uh, stick into a, into a um, UKI, but no code. Right? Why would we do this? Um, so that we can uh, pass this to the firmware and have it authenticated via Secure Boot um, and via the measurements how all the other uh, binaries are executed. So it's basically for us, we can load these things into memory, have the firmware authenticate and measure it, but then not actually jump into it to execute them, but simply use the data inside of it. So what's the benefit of this? Um, like the first kind of add-ons that we added, added is for kernel command lines. Then this comes back to the question that was asked there earlier. This is basically a way where you can uh, say, okay, these UKIs came, come pre-baked from the vendor, and then as you boot, you combine them with the local um, add-on, which is signed by a local key that is also accepted. Um, via shim or something like this, um, and then uh, the, the, the data of that overrides um, the information in the UKI. So this adds a little bit of, uh, of modularity to it, um, um, reflecting the fact that, yeah, probably multiple different sources of um, information shall, shall be, like, or owners of uh, 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 resources of the boot um, shall exist. So yeah, PE binaries that lack executable code, that are mules for actual other information, there are secure boots signed like UKIs themselves, authenticated by firmware. Okay, this is very confusing. This is, I mean, not confusing, it's just wrong. Like, they're secure boots signed and authenticated by the firmware. Uh, they're measured by systemd stub as well. Um, yeah, right now we do support them fully for kernel command line that's released, but uh, they're gonna be uh, add-ons also for device tree. Um, like, the purpose is basically that, uh, yeah, device tree is this thing that you need know, embedded devices, and yeah, sometimes you wanna, like you define your own board and then you want to have a trusted way to um, um, uh, stuff that device tree into the system without changing the kernel that comes from the vendor. So this is the way to go. Init RD is something that the next OS people want. Yeah. Uh, these things can be placed next to a UKI um, so that they are only associated with that UKI so that when the UKI is booted, then SD stub, uh, like system stub, will pick them up and uh, use them. But they can also be placed in a global directory in the in the uh, ESP, and then they apply to everything that is booted. Um, UK5 builds them because they are the same thing as uh, 
as regular UKIs, um, they're PBE binaries with stuff in them. Um, so uh, yeah, you can use the same tools to build them. Um, they provide some modularity um, that is like in its combination local to the final deployment, right? Like so, this is outside of the vendor realm um, and distributes the ownership of the resources. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of other stuff like this stuff. Um, I'm probably going to talk about that in the TPM talk a lot more. So it's really not that bad that we'll miss that here. We have five minutes, and I'd rather spend them here in discussions than going through the rest of the slides. There's already the first question. Um, so back to the secure boot thing. At some point, I had this setup where I enroll my keys into the secure boot keyring, and then I um, seal the passphrase of the hard drive to the, this PCR that has the secure boot state. Um, and every time I did a kernel update, I have this script that generated, uh, you know, signed everything and all that. So this is how you expect it to work for the community distros, or is there a difference from what you are? So uh, um, the, the interesting thing, like the PCR7, which contains the secure boot state, um, it's not stable, right? Like because uh, the the um, uh, denial is like the the the, the invalidated um, hashes and certificates is constantly growing and it's maintained centrally by the UFI group, and nowadays FW update D uh, will update this uh, the 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 key ring um, automatically for you. So it's not stable. It's also gone something that changes regularly, like the firmware PCRs are. So uh, um, this makes it difficult to bind uh, um, stuff to it, but I'm do talking tomorrow in my talk about some new component of systemd, which I call systemd's PCR lock, which is supposed to um, give you a second um, uh, uh, policy that you can use bind disk room encryption to that protects, uh, uh, like that locks to firmware, to secure boot state, um, to a couple of other things, basically all the other stuff that is measured into PCRs. Uh, the big difference is that it's inherently local because, uh, um, yeah, the policy is not controlled by the West vendor. The West vendor cannot say which firmware, which um, extension cards you have, which secure boot policy you have enrolled and things like that. Um, this policy is going to be inherently local so that it looks at your local system and uh, tries to lock things down. So this is how I would envision this uh, works in the long run, that you ha run the combination of things, right? Like one policy supplied by the vendor of the West that needs to be fulfilled, and then a second policy that also needs to be fulfilled, which is local and locks it against firmware and all the other stuff. Hi, um, two questions. Um, the first one, how much uh, have you measured how much um, to the boot time is added by doing all these verifications? Uh, I have uh, not actually, but it's not measurable like in the VMs. Like it's it's hashing a couple of things. Um, you know, TPMs are not fast, but writing like this just echoes something to the PCR. Or well, let's say it like this. You know, Grub, um, this terrible other bootloader, it measures every single uh, command it executes. Um, and uh, this is like uh, I don't know. I, I saw this yesterday in, on uh, Lucas' computer because he still uses Grub for some reason. Um, but it's like uh, if you're used to Grub boot times, um, this is way faster because we measure so much less, right? They basically they measure this chosen execution path, every part of it, which I think is a really stupid idea because it's not predictable. We measure individual components, like the whole code. Um, uh, uh, of the thing, which is much better predictable, um, and also means much fewer measurements. But these measurements are done um, like on the CPU, like the the data that is going to be measured is hashed first on the CPU, and then the resulting hash is passed through a very slow connection. Um, but it's just going to be this uh, very short hash to the TPM. So. Uh, you shouldn't be concerned. Like, I mean, there are so many more measurements done by the firmware than we do that it's, yeah, I don't know. And um, the other question, um, you showed the kernel install stuff, and you said uh, for the community distribution, it's run locally. Um, but there still would be the attack, attack vector once the system is um, uh, unencrypted and running, and there is some attack on the system that um, the, the rootkit or whatever could then sign a malicious kernel itself somehow. So for the local stuff, you always have to have an so air gap system to to, to it, that's a very good here. point. Um, like I'm talking about this about my other at my other talk tomorrow. Uh, there are mechanisms that we can do to to lock this down further. Like for example, this this systemd PCR lock thing that I have been briefly talking about. Uh, the design is basically that you can sign. The, like, that you can prepare the policy um, for accessing the disk encryptions only during a certain phase of the boot, 
meaning that um, it's not sufficient to exploit a system. It's you have to exploit a system and then um, get a persistency um, that lasts until the next early boot phase, right? Like before um, the system even has mounted, like run, started regular user services. And that's a, it's a much higher um, degree of protection, right? Like because, uh, yeah, if I manage to exploit my, I don't know, engine X or something like this, um, getting persistency in the early boot process, because the assumption, of course, is that the UKIs start up in pristine environment, right? Like they do not um, have states that much and the, they have very few inputs that are all authenticated, right? So, uh, yeah, that's that's what I say. But I think my time's over, so, okay, one last thing yeah. and then... Yeah, yeah. Oh, we still have two minutes, okay. All right, great, yeah. Uh, this, this is a, <coughs> sorry, a bit more abstract question. Uh, I've, how much of this is really supposed to be distro-specific? Because uh, it seems like it's just an init RD and a kernel image, which then kicks off the rest of the boot process, loading the, the main system, right? Why is this a distro specific thing and not just its its own blob that loads arbitrary, uh, well, signed and verified, of course, by the user, but just an arbitrary kernel with an arbitrary system? Like, why is this not its own just generic <coughs> bootloader? Why is this is entirely generic, right? Like, uh, like the implementations of all of what I'm saying are in systemd. In systemd, is this so sweet that many distributions. Uh, yeah, yeah, use. right. So, so if this is just to load a system date distro, why have every distro supply its own keys and its own configuration of this instead of just booting into a system D system and allowing the whatever's on the encrypted hard disk to do the local? Well, system? I mean, because nobody implemented this so far. <laughs> I mean, so, so basically, the, the, the state of TPMs and, and these things, I think, is pretty horrible um, before this came. Like, Windows and the other operating systems, and particularly Android, and, and these things are way ahead of us. And it's a little bit embarrassing, um, the level of boot protection we so far had, um, in particularly on the commercial distributions, like on, on clouds that are, that are like the primary attack uh, um, uh, goals there. So this is my attempt to make this all so digestible, so uh, manageable, um, and so uh, common part of what an OS is that the distributions, um, like all distributions sooner or later, at least the ones that subscribe to the system, uh, would just enable this because um, it's easy to some, I mean, it's never going to be trivial, but um, this, yeah, hopefully eventually you don't really have to think about this anymore because system just gives you all this stuff. All you have to still do then is to sign your UKIs and there you go. I think we're out of time. Sorry, folks. You can take it to the hallway. Let me uh, join me uh, thanking Lennart. <laughs>